Good morning. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming so bright and early to our session this morning on economic narratives. I want to introduce this by telling you a story about uh, something I heard when I was first uh, when I first joined the Wall Street Journal as a journalist. I was told about a legendary page one editor who told us how to write stories that people wanted to read, and he had a very simple formula: people, <laughs> readers are interested in animals, people, numbers <laughs> in that order. <laughs> And I said, well, that's unfortunate because my specialty goes in the opposite direction. I'm good with numbers first, people second, animals last. And I think economics as a profession has a similar problem. The uh, point of economics is in some sense to take the people and the animals out and focus on what we know. But that is not how people think. People think in terms of stories and things that they can actually picture in their mind. And that's why I think today's panel, I think, it will take us into some very interesting territory because it can help us understand why there is such a chasm these days between what the technocracy, what the economists with all their numbers and their models believe people should think and, and uh, act upon and what is actually going on in the world. So um, we have, uh, I think you all have the details in your panel, but briefly we have Raghu Rajan from the University of Chicago, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Thaman from uh, Singapore, Bob Schiller from Yale, and uh, Ying Zheng Hao from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences still. And we're all going to uh, address various aspects of this issue and then have a conversation and we'll bring you all into it later on. Bob, let me talk, uh, ask you first because you actually gave an address at the American Economic Association that dealt with the power of narratives. And there was a line in it where you talked about most people think through narratives, but economists are terrible with narratives. Tell me a little bit about that and why it's a problem. Well, I think uh, I date it back to David Hume in the 1740s who first talked about the power of narratives. It's been growing in the social sciences, particularly anthropology, sociology, also psychology, that you have to understand what stories people are telling, what, which are motivating. But economists have resisted that, and I think it's a shame. So I got, I got up in front of the whole American Economic Association and told them so. Uh, I didn't get booed, uh, <laughs> I'm happy to say. I think uh, maybe even the econ profession is moving back toward recognizing. Partly what, what is happening is economists are studying digital texts. They, like to, they still like to count things, but at least they're, count, they're trying to count ideas that uh, spread. So what I emphasize in my American Economic Association presidential address was that narratives uh, as you say, they, they are enlivened by human interest. Uh, maybe animals, too, but I don't emphasize that. And they, they grow epidemically. Uh, so the mathematical model that I brought in was uh, the Kermack-McKendrick 1927 a model of epidemics. But it has two parameters, contagion rate and recovery rate. It's a very simple model. And there are, in the 90 years since, there have been many versions. But what you have to recognize is that ideas about how the economy work are linked with stories, especially, I think, celebrity stories, some famous person who becomes godlike in our imagination. And they, they have a contagion rate. Now, the critical difference is the contagion rate has to be greater than the recovery rate at the beginning. This is what Kermack and McKenna, or it has no chance. Lots of great economic theories have no chance because they don't meet that threshold. As soon as that threshold, this is what, like in a disease epidemic, as soon as the threshold is reached, the epidemic starts to grow and it can eventually hit the whole population. Then, it, then eventually it goes down again, even if the parameters are constant. The Kermack-McKendrick model also emphasizes that there are fast epidemics and slow epidemics. Some of them occur rapidly um, and some of them are slow. So one of my favorite examples is the epidemic of Karl Marx. You heard of him? Everyone's heard of him. Not because he's right, because he's contagious. But it wasn't even in his lifetime. When he died in 1883, he wasn't well known. Uh, somehow the Karl Marx story took off and the epidemic grew until the 1970s when it peaked according to my data. That's the kind of thing, and it's now slowly, slowly declining. Um, that's the way these things move. So you have to look at the nature of the story, why it's contagious, and policymakers have to think about what 
their policy implies in terms of narratives. And some of the most important policy, I mean, I'll just conclude on the thought. One of the most important things that was done with the financial crisis of 2007 through 9 uh, was uh, when the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the head of the Bank of England met and decided to bail out Northern Rock, even though they had questionable authority to do it. That was a bank that was going through a run because they thought, we don't want these bank run stories to go viral again. It will threaten everything. So they, they, they were, and the same thing happened in the US with the Prime Reserve Fund with um, Ben Bernanke. So it was their uh, understanding of narratives that saved us, I think, from uh, worse crisis. Thanks very much, Bob. Thurman, I want to turn to you next and bring this up to date in terms of the policy context. One of the narratives I think that's been very persuasive, at least in, uh, in the Western world, is the idea that merit matters and that essentially if you work hard and study and do the right thing, you're going to do really well. What has happened to that narrative and has another narrative taken its place in the Western, in, in developed societies? Well, I think, Greg, you're, you're right. Um, to my mind, the most powerful narrative, if you think of it on a global scale, advanced countries, developing countries, in the last 70 years, has been the idea that through markets and meritocracy, everyone's going to have a chance to have a rising standard of living. And because it actually happened for a period of time in the advanced countries and some developing countries, people saw their parents, their aunties, their uncles actually doing much better and they expected it will continue. And then in the developing world, you had some countries that started catching up. Actually, there was a very small number of countries in East Asia, and then you had China uh, catching up on a much larger scale. But there's actually been an epochal shift in this narrative for two reasons. First, what happened in the West uh, in that period uh, following the war hasn't been sustained, has faltered, and in some ways is, is, is broken. Uh, it's really an epochal shift because if you, quite apart from the data, which actually shows that median wages, at least for men, um, have, have fallen in real terms. For anyone entering the workforce by, by the late 60s onwards, you're earning less over your lifetime compared to the preceding generation, which is, which is a remarkable fact. But it's also in perceptions. It's also in the narrative. If you look at um, what Pew Global Research um, does, and that's one of the best uh, surveys we have globally, of what parents think their children are going to earn in their lifetimes, we're now at a position where about 60% of people in the advanced world think that children will not do as well as parents. It's a little lower than 50% for countries like Sweden. It's, about, it's over 70% for France and Japan. That's an epochal shift. The idea that progress no longer exists through markets and meritocracy. And in the developing world, we have to remember, because the headlines are always about China or you know, Singapore or uh, Taiwan or Hong Kong, the bulk of the developing world is in Africa, South Asia, and Latin America. And it's stagnant. They haven't caught up. They haven't caught up relative to US productivity levels or standards of living since the 60s. And within those societies as well, not that many people have caught up. So that's a very fundamental shift, and it means that new solutions are required. Uh, if, if you just permit me to carry on for just a minute, and we can come back to it yeah. later. The, there's been a great overemphasis on macroeconomic policy, and you know, Raghu and I have had a lot of discussions on this. Part of the reason is uh, people have lost faith in the microeconomic and community-based and social solutions. And they've lost face for two reasons. First, the solutions of the right, which had to do with leaving things to the markets, uh, haven't worked. They've accentuated the disadvantages and the advantages that people start off with. They've accentuated inequalities. The solutions of the left on the microeconomic level, economic solutions like nationalization, have also failed. And the social solutions of the left have run their cause and exhausted their potential. The redistributive solutions have exhausted themselves. And there's inf if anything, there's now a hardening of attitudes towards the poor in a range of advanced societies. 
So we need a new policy narrative that's not macro, that is micro, that's social, and that's community. And it means reinvesting in people, reinvesting in innovation and even disruption, because we have far too little disruption taking place, in fact, which explains why productivity growth is low and wage growth is low. But it means not, you know, getting past this recent narrative of compensating the loser, that's a terrible narrative. It's a defeatist narrative. We've got to talk about reinvesting in people at every stage of their lives so that we can have more innovative economies, but we also have people adapting to innovation and making the most of it. And I believe it is actually possible. There is that policy space that relies on social policies, that relies on market and industrial policies, and that relies also on a political strategy that the political center has to inhabit and has to breathe a lot of life into. That's a, actually a perfect opportunity, uh, Jing Feng, to bring you into this story. Um, you know, Thumman mentioned, you know, for example, China is always held up as a shining example of rapid development and progress. But as you know, there was enormous social turmoil associated with that progress. What narratives emerged from that history in China and how does it affect uh, the Chinese government's efforts to move progress forward today? Uh, actually, about the narratives, uh, especially narr uh, narratives in China, there are a lot of stories, uh, uh, a lot of competing stories of why China developed so fast, how it developed so fast. Somebody even call it uh, a China miracle to, to study about. But um, uh, so we, we tend to think that uh, whenever there's a good economic result, uh, that indicates that there's good governance, there's good institutions, or, or everything's good. So now people are trying to figure out <coughs> what are those uh, experiences that that is miraculous that can be uh, pushed to all the other countries. But actually, when we compare compared uh, the the catch up uh, process of China with some of those uh, quickly catch up the countries in the history, we found out that it is not that uh, special because uh, um, for Germany in late in, uh, 19th century, it also experienced a really rapid uh, catch up phase um, after the, the reform of Ismay. And also for some other country like Japan in the 19th century, in early 20th century, and also the East Asian countries after the World War II, we all found out that they have these kind of, uh, um, for one decade or more, two decades of the rapid growth of about 10% of GDP every year. And uh, uh, all these, uh, different models have some kind of uh, similarity. Uh, they they catch up with uh, they they just copy the technological development in their uh, advanced countries and they just uh, put all resources together and things like this. If we do this historical study, we found out that perhaps the experience now in China is not that. Uh, special. It is uh, just because we try to follow up the others, we copied experiences, we, we just uh, um, try to uh, study from the others. And uh, in that phase, um, it, it is always uh, quite quick in, in development. But after that, if you got into the technological frontier, you need to be creative, innovative into the other uh, phase. Then all these countries face the some kind of problems. Only really few succeed in the next phase. Um, they, they are fa failures in history as well. So that makes the Chinese government feel pressure. Uh, what, what will happen in the next phase if we are uh, already on a, a le higher level? And this uh, cut the narrative of economics evaluation completely different. And also, the, the reason for me to um, think about the narrative of economics also uh, came from my experience. When I was a young girl in 1990s, I, I uh, witnessed uh, some of my relatives 
lost their jobs in the SOE reforms. Uh, SOE state owned enterprises? Yes, state owned uh, enterprises reforms. They lost their jobs, they got no income, they, they just sell small items in the street, and the life was really hard at that time. I, I, I think that, oh, the SOE reform, that is so bad, it makes people suffer a lot. But as I become an economist, um, uh, after my PhD studies, I found out that uh, all the SOE reforms in China was really a good reform to Chinese economy because it just uh, helped the chi Chinese economy uh, to to transform from uh, uh, the the old phase into the now a modern uh, a modern state. Then I started to think about the narratives. What is right? What is wrong? Because ex economics is not um, uh, only a positive science uh, with uh, true or false. It is sometimes it's normative with uh, what should we do or what should That's we a not. Good point, yeah. Right. Yeah. So so uh, it is the such kind of reforms. It helps the economics on the whole, but it makes some people suffer. So I started. Uh, I st started to think about uh, how we state these kind of stories, whether it's good or whether it's not. Uh, it maybe depends on the perspective of how you see it. But now as I'm an economist, I strongly suggest that uh, a, a new round of SOE reform should take place in China because I see the necessity of that reform from all the figures or the numbers or the models uh, in economics. But as you say, there's a powerful narrative in the Chinese uh, population that SOE reform was very convulsive and damaging, right? Yeah. And is that a problem if the government wishes to push ahead further with state-owned enterprise reform? Sure. Now the government uh, is really uh, n not that uh, eager to push forward the SOE reforms in, in China, one reason is because they are afraid of a social uh, problem, social objections, uh, especially in the nor north and east uh, uh, provinces in China, because in, in those provinces, the economy relied heavily on uh, uh, SOE, state-owned enterprises. So if uh, there is um, heavy reform happen there, and uh, the the, the society may be get in, into turmoil. So the, the government is not really hesitant to uh, pushing forward all these uh, required reforms. So the economists uh, always uh, um, just uh, uh, suggest that uh, the reforms should carry out, but that also uh, needs to face the, the problem of trade-off. So Raghu, as you can hear in China, there's an issue where the economists want one thing and other people seem to want something else. I wanted you to sort of reflect a little bit on how uh, economists or technocrats more broadly are in some sense in a losing battle these days about the right narrative. Sure. Uh, well, let's uh, start with uh, where Bob started, which is um, stories, uh, narratives. Uh, when economists hear the word stories, they wrinkle their nose and say, this is below me. <laughs> uh, I mean, in, in some sense, all models are stories. And uh, really where economists try and go further is what's, what's the evidence, what's the data, how sustainable is this story? And that's where they believe they depart a little uh, uh, from the uh, tradition of narratives. Let me talk about two narratives, one which seems to have caught on and one which periodically comes about. Uh, the first is to uh, Greg's point, which is that post-World War II, we had a tremendous consensus that uh, the world had been broken apart by divisive politics, that we had to come together once again, and there was a dominant narrative of let's bring down barriers to trade, eventually to capital flows. This will benefit all of us, the new international order, and let's leave it to the technocrats to figure it out because we politicians made a mess the last time around. And, and as a result, there, was, there were mainstream voices, the radicals were shut out, and the technocrats were given a largely free hand for a long time. And that worked. Now, it didn't work only because the technocrats had the right answers, it worked to Thurman's point because we had tremendous growth gains from the uh, second industrial revolution. 
I think I date my industrial revolutions <laughs> differently from the World Economic Forum. Uh, and, and that pushed growth right up till the 1970s when it stopped. And, and then you started having more frictions, more differences between the left and the right on the way forward. And that's sort of come to a culmination at, at this point when nobody believes anybody else. And we're challenging the technocrats. We're asking them, what solutions do you have, especially after the global financial crisis? And this is very problematic because explaining what you do is difficult. There are no simple narratives. Build the wall is not a narrative that the, that the uh, economists can offer. Uh, you know, uh, protectionism is something they've always fought against. But it's much, uh, protectionism resounds much more as a story. I'm going to erect a wall, I'm going to keep out imports, and you'll have your jobs. And so now we have a much harder task uh, as economists of trying to explain why what we suggest as policies might in fact work and what has gone wrong and how do we fix what has gone wrong. And clearly there are lots of answers that we have explored, we need to bring, bring up, but it's a much more complicated task than when we could say, trust us, we know the way and we'll take you forward. So that's a narrative which worked for about 30 years, 35 years and has started breaking down. Another narrative which confronts us today and uh, goes to the issue of what catches and what doesn't is this idea that we'll be replaced by machines, right? It comes up every 15 years. Um, the idea of generalized artificial intelligence and super intelligence at some point is something that's always predicted 15 years ahead. Uh, right from 1960, you see experts predicting 15 years from now, we will be all replaced. If you think about the idea of universal basic income, we should pay everybody the point that Thurman was making as defeatist, I think, uh, is something that at least I've, you can see President Johnson setting up a commission to worry about that, which proposes universal basic income because in the 1960s they thought they'd all be out of jobs. Now that's come up again. I think this is a discussion which is going on today. The real question is nobody knows how fast this is going to happen. Even the experts are all uh, in disagreement. We've seen massive progress, but the idea that we will all be replaced in some form or the other by, by thinking uh, machines, uh, ask the experts, it's still 15 to 20 years ahead. Uh, maybe 10, but certainly not the next five when we can be held up to our predictions. So the question is, why does this narrative come up every so often? Uh, and you know, we never do anything about it. Uh, you know, uh, we all, uh, uh, this can be dangerous. We know that driverless cars and driverless trucks are on the horizon. Tremendous numbers of people depend on it for a living. What are we doing about it? Uh, very little, and maybe we believe once again this narrative will not <laughs> catch hold in a sense, just like it hasn't caught hold in the past. I don't know, let me stop there. Um, Bob, actually I wanted to uh, move to you then because Raghu raises an interesting point. You know, economists have these models, and gosh, isn't it a shame that other people don't believe our models? And when, when I listen to you, a lot of the models never have a chance of working because they presume a behavior, a rational behavior on the part of individuals that doesn't reflect how they actually operate. And reading your work, especially with respect to financial bubbles and so forth, I find myself sort of believing, uh, agreeing with you. Uh, so in your view, um, are, is there a lot of economic phenomena that just does not obey models because it reflects <laughs> contagious behavior? And I want to bring this up to the present because to Raghu's point, protectionism and inward-looking policies aren't supposed to be good. But enough people believe that they can make the country great again and that they can respond and animal spirits will kick in could in fact the narrative change and that we will see very good economic outcomes flow from a policy that the technocrats say should actually be a failure. Uh. I have a lot to say on these things. I don't know how to come back. <laughs> I'm writing a book now on this. Uh, so, so give us the elevator pitch, not the uh, <laughs> dire part. So uh, the idea of uh, human, I, I don't know where to start on this, but sure. the idea uh, that machines are replacing humans first became really big in 1811 with the Luddites. It came back again. These things are come somewhat <laughs> cyclical. Uh, I realize Henry George's best-selling book called Progress and Poverty, 1879, was about this too. Because there was a big revolution in agriculture going on and millions of people were losing their jobs and having to move to the city and try to find some industrial job. 
But yeah, they, they come and go. Um, so Raghu, I, I think that it's not just another, it, it might be worse this, this next, maybe not 15 years, uh, because the, the way machines are replacing us now is more fundamental. I mean, I can talk to this thing in my pocket and ask it questions, and it will answer. Now it will be driving my car. Uh, you, it's, th th there's kind of an exponential growth path to the uh, technology, and we're really... I, I think that there's more of a primal fear now than there was in 1879. Although 18... Progress in Poverty was a huge bestseller. It sold billions of copies, uh, I even in the 19th century. People were really worried then. It's even bigger now. And I think a lot of things that are happening now trace their back to this new narrative, that this time it's really going to be bad. Um, and, it's not and it's supported by in inequality data, too. So it, it's not like it hasn't started happening. Well, I, actually, Jing Feng, I want you to talk about this because you've actually written a short story, Folding Beijing, and in it you sort of imagine a future where automation has actually made a lot of people redundant. Why did you write that story, and do you actually believe that will happen? Uh, I, I don't think that uh, science fiction writers write uh, everything that they believe in is, uh, is, is definitely to happen. We, we only write about possibilities. Sometimes it's uh, maybe like, like a warning to the mm -hmm. others. Sometimes it's because the, the dramatic uh, requirement of uh, literature. Uh, but this time, uh, when I wrote uh, Folding Beijing in 2013, I really think about uh, uh, about the poor people, especially the low income, low uh, education people. What will be their life like in in a fast uh, technological developing uh, era? So th that's my my starting point. I think about what if these people cannot adapt themselves into the next era? Then what? Should our government do? And then I wrote the story of Folding Beijing. It's about the enlarged inequality in in the coming era of automation, with a lot of people being replaced by by the technology. So, so I uh, start. Uh, I created this uh, city to to just adapt this question. I think it is still an issue even after five years. I I've written this story, uh, and I I also uh, did projects uh, on research of the, um, the automation process now happening in China. And we went to those factories. We went to those corporations and asked the, the owner, "Oh, do, uh, do you think that you will?" Uh, import more machines to replace workers? They say, yes, I think we definitely will because that's we, we got benefit, lo lot of benefit from this process. So I, I do uh, see the, the, the process is uh, going on. So that still is a problem of those uh, educations and trainings of those uh, low education people. So I, I really do agree that we have to empower the people more in the future, or, or that that is a problem now. I mean, what do you think? Technological unemployment, a very powerful yeah. and deep-rooted narrative. Yeah. Is it a correct one? Well, first, I think um, uh, we're not going to know the answer to this question of whether automation and artificial intelligence and big data is going to replace human beings by looking into a crystal, crystal ball. Um, the answer to that question will depend on what we do, uh, what we do now and, and what we keep doing and adapting as we go along. In other words, it's what economists would call path dependency. The outcome will depend on the path you take. And uh, that's a point which uh, has a lot of policy implication. Uh, first, we know from actual practice that the types of jobs being created uh, that complement new machines, intelligent machines, uh, involve a lot of augmentation of human skills and intelligence. That complementarity is a very interesting uh, new area. Um, and we're seeing it in practice in the fourth industrial revolution, if I use the World Economic Forum's uh, <laughs> uh, chronology. Uh, I've seen it in, in pl factory plants, uh, and it's, it's very interesting. Uh, 
you won't be able to use those machines if you didn't augment human skills. And you won't have those human jobs if you don't augment human skills. But if we don't start now in a very concerted way in each of our societies to s start young and develop through life everyone's potential for adapting to a new age, we're not going to get there. So it's not about economic forecasting or uh, uh, crystal ball gazing. It's about what you do now. And this, the, the point is, there's so much untapped potential. There's so much inefficiency and inequity in current day education systems. I don't have to name countries, but you know which high school systems are broken. And I would say in general, higher education is not fit for purpose for the future. It's been overly academicized. It lacks that blend of theoretical and practical knowledge that the real world needs. And it, it lacks that uh, sense that everyone, regardless of your learning style, is able to just keep learning. It's more of a barrier rather than an opportunity provider. So the very fundamental issues, huge untapped potential, untapped potential not just from an efficiency and innovation point of view, but from an equity point of view. And until we address that, it's no point talking about what could happen 20 or 30 years from now. What happens then will depend on what we do. Bob, is it easier to tell and convince people of negative narratives than positive narratives? Oh, the only way you can beat a narrative is with a new narrative. One thing that I stressed is that narratives have a human quality that is uh, inscrutable. Uh, creating a successful narrative is like creating a successful motion picture. Motion picture studios who ought to know how to do it uh, keep trying and they have a lot of failures. And they often then will repeat the same Star Wars, what version is it in now? They don't know why Star Wars worked so well, but they keep repeating it because it did. Uh, that's, a, that's a problem. That's why we don't uh, converge rapidly on the truth. The, the true narrative that beats a uh, fake news narrative is kind of dull. Uh, and it, it may be expressed by careful people who, don't, who aren't flamboyant <laughs> and don't make good stories. In the Chi uh, Jingfeng in China, where the government has quite a bit more influence over the information that people consume than they do here, is that, is that less of a problem? Or does it, do the Chinese authorities also have to deal with you know, narrative contagions that are you know, a problem for the story they want to tell? Yes, they, they do face the problem as well. Although that uh, the uh, government uh, owns uh, a lot of uh, press companies, uh, however, now in the uh, information uh, era, people get a lot of news from abroad, from the, on the internet. So now the, the government uh, really pay attention to what people are talking about on the internet. And uh, uh, they are department uh, that uh, observing and monitoring what people are suggesting, what people's uh, feelings on the internet every day in the government. And now I, I uh, at least uh, I know there is a program uh, teaching Chinese government how to communicate with the public. Uh, and a lot of ch uh, Chinese government are now uh, started to studying that. That's the, perhaps the first time <laughs> in, in history because uh, uh, in, in the past, uh, there are no so many competitive narratives, uh, and the government do not need to learn about what uh, the uh, ordinary people are saying. But now they realize that uh, it is really, really important because there's it's it's an open arrow with all the information in and out, and it is really difficult for you to just keep one story and to let everybody to accept it. So I, I think that um, in, in the future, um, really a story, competitive stories uh, will emerge uh, because the, the time is changing, the era is changing, uh, but uh, we as a human being, one of our uh, consistent uh, humanity is searching for a story that is consistent uh, to just um, pick up all the uh, different pieces and uh, make it uh, uh, a complete meaningful story. That's our humanity. Um, so uh, actually, one way I wanted to bring this into the current situation is that, for example, when people are looking for an explanation for why uh, 
their wages aren't going up. It, it might be easier to believe a narrative that there is somebody out there who, who means them ill, whether it's a foreigner or uh, whether it's imports or something like that. It's easier, it might be politically also more advantageous to push that narrative than a narrative that sort of attributes to impersonal forces of technology. And so I'm wondering, what would your advice be to a policymaker who's trying to contemplate which of these narratives to try either to promote or needs to push back on? Raghu, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, let me, uh, I think you have to be um, sort of cognizant. There are three big forces that are hitting us today. One is technology, but the second is population aging, uh, which is very important, and the third is climate change. And all of them are coming together at the same point. And I think the uh, if you focus on one of the issues, for example, joblessness, you come up with a solution which perhaps is detrimental to the other two. Uh, take, for example, this, uh, you know, you, you, you asked Bob if protectionism would be a, a, a good narrative in the sense that it creates jobs, creates animal spirits, creates investment, etc. But protectionism at this stage for the West is perhaps the worst possible solution given that the West is aging and given that increasingly demand for Western products will be in the rest of the world. At this point, if we break the international order that we had post-war and go to uh, little fiefdoms, uh, when it comes to aging and when demand starts shrinking, much as it's doing in Japan, uh, at that point, uh, the emerging markets are gonna say, well, you're the guys who created this system. And why do you ask us to participate once again in a new global order when it suits you? You're the ones who kept out our, import, our exports at that time. So I think that's, if we, if we take one issue and, and address that in a, in a very imperfect way, we risk the others. Uh, of course, we can go into climate change also. So it, it seems to me very important that we find the right narrative which allows us to address all three. And this is where I think Tharman's point that uh, we have to keep emphasizing that the way to do this is in a cooperative uh, global fashion. We all have our homework to do and there's plenty of homework. Uh, but if we do this, we can address all three problems. If we don't, uh, we're gonna have a fractured world which is gonna be incapable of addressing any of the three. I mean, can you think of anybody who's actually got this right, who's been able to replace a bad narrative with a good narrative and get good results? Well, I think there are examples um, uh, all over the world. Uh, I think this, and I'm generalizing here, but I think the Swedes and the Danes do a much better job at um, regenerating people. Um, smaller societies like Singapore try very much to do that as well. Even if you look at the United States, uh, even if you look at the Rust Belt, uh, there's a vast difference between Milwaukee, Minneapolis, Pittsburgh, and the rest of the Rust Belt. They're really two Rust Belts. They were all hit by uh, either globalization or technology or some combination, and they lost core industries. But some have bounced back. And how do they do it? So there are actually lessons all over the world. And I think the lessons involve not just policy, but a narrative coming out of people's experience and the experience of being part of a community of learning where everyone is engaged. You're not just waiting for some, something to come your way, but everyone is engaged. The mayor and the local leadership, the deans and the teachers and the colleges, the business leaders, former schoolmates who knew each other. When everyone is engaged at a community level, uh, it, it enthuses people. And one of the real assets you find is that an optimistic ethic and an aspiring ethic tends to compound, just like a pessimistic narrative tends to compound. You know, part of my job uh, uh, involves staring at Schiller's PE. Um, <laughs> but that's a very different world because that the world of financial markets and economic markets in general is one where there is something called reversion to the mean. 
eventually fundamentals assert themselves. And I, I, uh, I've been looking very carefully at Schiller's PE very recently, by the way. <laughs> uh, but eventually, fundamentals assert themselves, and you get reversion to the mean. But you have no reversion to the mean in social culture. You get a compounding. You get, and you see this in a range of cities and towns around the world, and unfortunately some countries, where you get some sort of social form of what the economists call hysteresis, where it's not just about the economic variables, but social habits tend to get set. They tend to get reinforced. You see what your classmates were doing. Uh, you see someone out of a job not able to get back in. You see discrimination, and you get a hardening of attitudes. And once you get that social hysteresis, uh, it's not reversible easily. It needs a new activism, not just the markets. It needs a new activism, and that activism has to be about spurring social mobility, starting from young, developing networks that can influence people. And some of the very interesting research, by the way, coming out of uh, social networks and innovation uh, shows that it's not just uh, your economic status in life, not just the disadvantages and advantages you have, but who you knew. Uh, the fact that female innovators are disproportionately influenced by other female innovators is a fascinating fact, not just innovation in general, the fact that role ma models matter. So there's, there's so much we are learning now about the importance of social networks, the importance of neighborhood policies, the importance of local and community action. But the nice thing is that it is being done in some places, which means it can be done in more. That's terrific. Uh, we have about 20 minutes left. I'd like to bring you on to the conversation. Um, Robert at the back has a microphone. If anybody has a question, please raise your hand. Um, so just state your name and uh, affiliation, and uh, if possible, direct your question to somebody on the panel. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Hi. My name's Kate Rayworth. Um, I, I teach at the Environmental Change Institute in Oxford. I'm a renegade economist because I, and I'm interested, any member of the panel who'd like to answer this, I believe that economics, as taught in universities, let's start with Econ 101, itself is a very powerful narrative which is unfit for this century. <laughs> Ask any student what they first learn is supply and demand. That's a narrative that the economy is the market and it's in equilibrium. That's actually two untruths in the first sentence. I, I don't think that's a good place to begin a degree. The economy is the household and the commons and the state and the market. If we want to talk about climate breakdown, catastrophic biodiversity loss, the destruction of the living world, we talk about it as environmental externalities. But the living world is the foundation of our well-being. It's not external to anything. And if we want to talk about success, it looks like never-ending growth. So would you agree that the very tenets of what we think is positive theory that we teach students is itself an extremely powerful narrative that's not fit for this century. We need a new narrative at the heart of economics education. Well, there's a very uh, provocative question for a panel of economists. Raghu, do you want to? You know, uh, look, uh, I think what you're saying is we need to think about a lot more things. I don't think you would deny that supply and demand matter in markets. And, and I think most economists would agree with you that, well, maybe I shouldn't speak for most economists, that most people would think there are lots of structures that need to be brought into the discussion over and above markets. And that markets themselves are a, a social creation, and we need to think about you know, what works, what doesn't, and so on. This dialogue is ongoing. It's, uh, I, I think uh, what we try and teach students, maybe you're saying the starting point should be different, but the fact is that these are things that matter, but there are other things that matter over and above. By all means, absolutely. Uh, Jing Feng? Yes. Uh, on this issue, I've also thought about um, the, the fitness of economic model is that uh, sometimes it is oversimplified. Uh, it is not wrong or uh, untrue, but it is uh, simplified. So we perhaps need some more uh, adding to this. One issue is about uh, the supply and demand. Uh, of course, we, we do see those kinds of uh, supply and demand uh, equilibrium in markets for a lot of goods a lot of products and it it still holds even in the real estate market in the financial market and in the consumer product markets i i think that it is a good law 
However, it is it cannot be applied to all fields in life because some of our uh, the, the demand require uh, no um, just um, lies into in the uh, our deep humanity such as we all need medical care we all need good education good medical service we all need uh, a nice home however uh, we we are not uh, all. Uh, we, we cannot all afford it. So sometimes the demand in economics means that uh, the effective demand, the, the, the demand you want it and you can afford it. But <laughs> for these all areas, everybody wants it, but not everybody can afford it. Then that's the big gap, uh, especially in the medical services and educational services. And then the, the market supplier can only uh, provide goods for those who can afford it, like medical services, however, for all the other people. So inequality really uh, accounts in these kind of situations. And that's uh, on some occasions, these economic laws uh, doesn't uh, seem to fit the real world. We, we need some new narratives in this field. And another uh, issue I want to suggest is about the complexity. Uh, I used to be a physics st a student, and uh, I, I knew that uh, Newton's law is, is, is a really a truth. Uh, we, we believe in it. Uh, it really uh, tells the, the, the truth of the world. However, Newton's law can only deal with a single project. <laughs> so, and the gravity law, you can only deal with two projects. If you add three or four projects and the equation, you cannot solve it. You cannot <laughs> find the answer of uh, uh, more project. And uh, the, the physicists are now still studying about the chaos with uh, more multiple objects. So it's it's not that the, the law is false or it's not correct. It's that the, the reality is complex that we just cannot solve it. So. Uh, also in quantum mechanics, the, uh, the Schrodinger equation, it is true, but you can only study one photon, one proton. <laughs> if you add up the three or four together, then the equation, we cannot find the answer. So then what does the physicists do is that they found out some uh, systematic equation that can account for a lot of uh, particles uh, moving. It's the statistic of mechanics. I think now in economics, we also need this higher level descriptions uh, that beyond uh, the one economic model of rational uh, agent, because now we, we set up one equation for a, a rational uh, agent in the economy, and we just multiple for n to, to describe the, the whole. But uh, it is not like this. People have interactions with each other, and there are some systematic complexity in the reality. So we need to account for these kind of uh, uh, interactions between agents and also the systematic complexity. So uh, I, I don't think that uh, economic models are, are, are untrue or n are not good. They are good, but we need more. I, I'm thinking about uh, how to just uh, model a, a complex world with diff different parts with inter interactions together. I think that's the next step, what we should do in economics. Terrific, thanks. Uh, we have a, a question over here. Hi, I'm Ricardo Hausman from Harvard University. Um, a narrative has uh, characters and uh, um, um, a little bit what, what Larry was just saying is that uh, you know uh, the characters are not always individuals. There are sort of like emerging characters, like for example, us, the nation, or something, right? And um, uh, and just like individuals, that us has a history, has a temperament, has aspirations, has. So so my question to you is, as you know, technology changes, globalization this, that, and the other, what is happening to different interpretations of the us? The us on whose behalf the government is supposed to act, the us on whose behalf, uh, you know, uh, we're seeking the good and so on. And, and obviously, you know, maybe fights over this us that are reflected in, you know, the importance that immigration policy is having these days as, so like an affront to our traditional sense of us and so on. 
and the fights over inclusion versus not inclusion because it would taint or change us. Uh, Bob, do you want to try that? Oh, this is a very important point that our, our sense of who we are and what we belong to is framed by stories. Benedict Anderson wrote a wonderful book about this. Uh, there used to be people called the Vandals. That was a Germanic tribe that uh, terrorized Europe <laughs> at one point. So people say, well, what's the Vandalic language? There was no, it, it was a story that some politician invented. We're the Vandals, <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's filled like that. It, only in modern times have nations been focused around language groups reliably. They're, they're, you come here in Davos, they're speaking some foreign language that Germans can't under, understand. But we, 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 have, we tell a story about it, that these are Germanic people. Our lives are filled, as you were saying, I'm glad you brought up complexity and chaos. Uh, the world is much more complex than we can comprehend, but we live with stories. Tom, I actually would like to hear your thoughts on this. So, uh, I think Ricardo's point is a very important one. Um, I think we all agree that what used to be us um, some decades ago has now become them and us. And the question is why? Uh, and I think it's very hard to explain this purely uh, through the economics of what's been happening or purely through the sociological and cultural explanations of what's been happening. If we hadn't had a stagnation, in fact decline in median incomes uh, in a good part of the advanced world, I don't think we'll be seeing what we're seeing today, even with the same tribal instincts, if I use that word conceptually. Uh, I don't think we'll be seeing it because there's something about absolute mobility that suppresses perceptions of relativity. That's a stylized sociological fact. When you have no growth in incomes or standards of living or some decline, the relativities become very important. And when those relativities uh, are not just about different economic agents, but people of one ethnicity, cosmopolitan or non-cosmopolitan versus another type of, another group, you get a very complex political brew as we've seen in many parts of the world. And it's not just about the US. You see it in Germany, you see it in France, you see it in Britain. But we must avoid being too reductionist about this and thinking it's all about incomes and economics, nor is it all about tribal instincts and uh, social formation. But the combination of the two, I think, uh, is most worrying today. And until we get absolute mobility back until we are able to grow incomes and wages of ordinary people on a sustained basis, you keep seeing these them and us perforations. They'll just keep coming up. Thanks. I'm actually going to move to... Uh, Let me just add uh, a couple of things here. Well, one is, uh, you know, there is a possibility for governments to do something about this, and I'd like to point to Singapore, which has tried to reduce the sense of divisiveness amongst different communities, for example, by getting them to live together, by housing projects which have both middle class as well as lower middle class people in the same place. One of the uh, concerns in some countries, certainly the United States, is that over the years, that kind of togetherness has broken down. The very poor don't talk to the middle class, the middle class don't talk to the upper classes, and therefore the kind of divisiveness that Ricardo is talking about has emerged in a much greater way. Uh, of course, some countries have always lived with it, but some countries are going that way, and that's becoming problematic. I think <laughs> governments can actually do something about this. Uh, question right here. Hi, my name is May Lee, and until recently, I was a dean for the School of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at a new university in Shanghai. Uh, I have two separate but related questions. So this morning, we've heard the panelists uh, talk about different time horizons for narratives. So we started with Marx, whose narrative was not dominant until 30 plus years in the future. Uh, we've talked about a recurrent human narrative around human fear uh, and utility. And then we've talked, that, and one we didn't talk about but mentioned is 
the fact that with social media and networks now, narratives can be formed almost immediately um, and out of the control of specific stakeholders. And I'm wondering, I'd like to hear the thoughts on the panelists on how you think stakeholders can form narratives given these competing uh, time horizons. And then maybe the second question uh, has to do with the fact that historically narratives were formed by a set of traditional stakeholders, uh, government, uh, let's say corporations, the church, and at least in the United States, sports. Uh, and over the course of the last 50 years, we've seen trust er erode in all those institutions. And again, with the advent of social media, I wonder if you have a view as to whether, A, there is a dominant stakeholder, and if so, who that is. Anybody want to I just want to say we haven't mentioned the marketing department, <laughs> uh, which every major university has. And they're at your service. You pay their consulting fees, and they will help. They will tell you things, for example, put television ads with actors and actresses who pretty much look like you're the demographic of the viewing audience, and have them do a little skit uh, that, that has word of mouth potential. Uh, so all of these uh, different stakeholders can uh, can benefit from the power that the marketing department wields. It's amazing to me that universities do this, and there's no complaint. But the, the good side of marketing is sometimes they do that. So, for example, it was the Ad Council in the United States, which is a public interest group of the marketing profession, that uh, created this movement, uh, an ad campaign for what's called designated driver. And the ads were very brief. They would show people at a party, everyone's drinking, and someone is offered a drink, and he says, no, I'm the designated driver, end of spot. But it just models the behavior for you. It was a very successful ad campaign, and this time for the good of society. Actually, I, but I do want to uh, get back to the a core question that she had, which is, uh, is one of the problems is that the institutions that we look to to tell our narratives are all basically, their credibility is shot. I mean, and if that's the case, what uh, stakeholder or what institution takes its place and how much of a problem is that? Does anybody want to, Jing Fang, do you have a uh, thought I, on that? I, I do think that's a problem in China, uh, not now, but uh, it happens uh, 30 years ago after the Cultural Revolution and opening up and the reform. Uh, suddenly people find out uh, what they've uh, believed for 30 years uh, as the market Marxism and also the um, all, all other uh, national narratives. Perhaps it's not the only truth in the world, and then what uh, can we believe? So I, I think that Chinese people uh, have seeking the answers for 30 years uh, because we are not that uh, religious country. It's not that uh, not that easy to just uh, take a religious account of the world, and it's, it's not that easy to just uh, uh, take uh, uh, the account from uh, just the Western world. So it is very uh, fractious uh, in opinion now in Chinese society. We, we did not find a dominant uh, narrative for the society, for the beliefs, for the uh, public opinions, and uh, it is still the, the process is going on. I just want to mention one uh, small uh, thing related to time scale, because uh, the, the time I got interested in economics is from, uh, I, I just want to know the uh, question of the big di uh, divergence in the history, how the industrial revolution happened. And uh, there, there was a, a famous uh, prop a question um, is in China, why the Industrial Revolution didn't happen in China. That problem has been studied for 100 years in China. We try to find out what are the weakness, what are the uh, disadvantages of ancient China, and um, all these kind of studies focused on China. But now I see a lot of studies actually found out that it is not China is so special at that time. It is that uh, the Britain might be very special because Industrial revolution didn't happen in any, but any country else. It's ha only happened in uh, Britain and now in US. So what is the speciality of these two countries? So then the focus just uh, switched from China maybe to, to Britain. And then I, I think that this changed the whole uh, uh, 
a consideration of how we consider ourselves because China has a really long history. We we need to understand the current situation yeah. in China based on our understanding. Okay. Okay, so we're almost out of time, but I want to take the moderator's prerogative to ask the final question. So Keynes has a famous line at the end of the general theory where he says that everybody ends up being a slave to some long uh, dead, long, some defunct economist. And what that said was two things. First of all, that economists were right, that their models are the right narratives. And second of all, that eventually everybody would listen to them. And if you're an economist, it's kind of an optimistic story. Now, we're all economists, I think. So I would actually like to ask each person on this panel, are you pessimistic? or optimistic that in the next te 10 to 15 years, the right narrative will, dem will, uh, will win? Uh, I'm not that optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Bob? Uh, as uh, president of the American Economic Association two years ago, I feel some loyalty to this profession. And I have to say, I was inspired by the papers that were submitted. They're not as crazy as it people make out. They're not as all into one. It's, it's a very diverse and intellectual group. But pessimistic so or optimistic? I'm optimistic, but we won't come to the right answer finally in 15 <laughs> okay. years. Okay. Thamid? I, I think we're going to have a tussle for many years to come between uh, different narratives. And whether the positive narratives uh, win out uh, will just depend on uh, actual experience, lived experience. And if you see a lot more Milwaukee's and Minneapolis's and Pittsburgh's or Tübingen's or Toulouse's of the world, maybe Singapore's, um, I think people will see that and figure out, well, maybe actually we can do the same. So there is now a marketplace. There is a competition of narratives. And that competition will not be decided on intellectually or in a debate. It will be decided on by lived experience around the world. And I'm optimistic in that regard. Okay. Raghu? Keynes was wrong. I, I don't think uh, politicians uh, sort of are slaves to economists. Uh, they just pick the economic theory that supports their particular stance. And so the question is, when do the politicians come around to the right view? And my guess is we could go through a, a certain amount of experimentation, some of it which could be very damaging, before we eventually realize that we're all in it together. We're in one world. And therefore, we have to keep an open world where we live with each other and do the right things. Eventually, that narrative will win out. But hopefully, we don't do a lot of damage before that. Great way to end. Thanks very much. I appreciate all the panelists and for all of you for coming and listening. Thanks.